Uh, my name is Oreo Pinto. I'm an accountant. I am an enrolled agent and a registered financial consultant. I do tax work, accounting work, and financial planning work. Um, welcome to this presentation. Uh, it's back to school, but it's it's just also kind of like a three quarters of the year, getting close to year end, uh, back to financial basics to make sure that we're on track with whatever we planned at the beginning of the year and to make sure that we're ready for the coming year as well. All right, so back to school, right? So one of the important parts now, this part of the year is uh, kids going back to school, uh, all grades. But now one of the important pieces is college planning, especially lately when college costs are so, so high, financial aid is not as good as it used to be. So there's a lot more financial planning that needs to be done by parents and students, prospective college students as well, uh, to make sure that you're in a better position. So when do you start planning for your college expenses? Basically parents, and this also includes grandparents, uncles, aunts, uh, usually, uh, a lot of the family members get involved in helping students with their financial aid and their college planning. So as soon as you, you know, so so like I asked in the beginning, when do you start planning for college? And it's probably as soon as you can, right? It's it's you'll have plans for your for your child. You want them to go to college. You might have an idea of which college you want them to go to. Uh, so as soon as you can start planning, that's when you start putting some money aside, and we'll go through that later on in the presentation, um, and making sure that your finances and the child's finances are in line, because a lot of the income on the parent's side will impact the student, and a lot of the student's impact, uh, income as well will impact their own financial aid package. So we'll go through um, the good and the bad of uh, the different uh, plans. How do you pay for college? There's a multitude of ways. Uh, and, and that goes through the FAFSA form is usually the first document that you file in order to get a financial aid uh, package in place, a financial aid file. The FAFSA form is the free application for federal student aid. And by completing that form, the student is basically laying out the type of income that the household has between his parents and himself. Um, and it'll it'll calculate based on an estimated tuition payment how much the student or the family should be contributing toward that education. And the FAFSA will make student or will give the students the eligibility for federal grants loans, uh, work study funds that a lot of the colleges will give to students if they work on campus during the school year. So a lot of the work through work study, you work on campus and in exchange for that, you get a stipend which gets put through uh, to pay for your uh, part of your college tuition. So you're basically working to get the money that you need and that's all handled by the school itself. Now, if there's any questions that come up, you can uh, ask them, just uh, interrupt and, and, and shoot them out. So this next screen goes through the college savings plan. So there are four major college plans or savings plans that parents and, and children can, can use to fund tuition expenses. The first two are similar. There's an UGMA, which is a Uniform Gifts to Minors Act. And there's an OTMA, which is Uniform Transfers to Minors Act. So the difference between the two is that an UGMA can be opened up in all the states. An UTMA, UTMA, can be opened up in the majority of the states. There's a few states that don't allow UTMAs just because of the way the, the state laws handle trust accounts, because that becomes a trust account. Um, other than that, they're very similar. They are both custodial accounts, which means that the parent man or the, the, the custodian, it can be a guardian, it can be a parent, it can be a grandparent, uh, manages the money, but the child, the, the minor, owns the money. So you open up an UGMA or an UPMA and you put, let's say, $1,000. At that point, the student is the owner 
of that account, but he cannot manage it, not do anything because he's a minor. So the custodian is the one that manages the assets in those accounts. And those accounts can be invested in anything. Another difference between the UGMA and the UDMA is that the UGMA, you can invest in money markets and all kinds of financial investments, stocks, bonds, et cetera. Whereas in an UDMA, the UTMA, you can invest in the same things as an UGMA, but you can also add real estate. So you can invest in real estate under a UTMA. You cannot do that under a UGMA. So that's one of the other differences between the two. And the custodian will manage those accounts. They'll go through, if there's an UPMA, they'll go through the real estate piece of it, make sure it's being managed correctly, um, that the income from it is, is, is being calculated correctly. If it's financial, in, financial account investment, similar to stocks and bonds, the custodian is responsible to make sure that they're doing their due diligence and making sure that the investments are correct and suitable for that type of account for that child. There's no contribution limits. You can put as much as you can, but they're subject to the gift tax. So if you put more than $18,000 in this particular, in this year, uh, there'll be some gift tax repercussions. Then we move on to the Coverdale. The Coverdale and the 529s are similar in that they are both uh, tax advantaged accounts, which means that their earnings are tax deferred. You do not pay taxes on any earnings on the accounts. Whereas on the UGMA and the UTMA, if you're invested in stocks and bonds and there were dividends that were paid and interest that was paid, the child in his tax return, even, he's a, even if he's a minor, he still has to file a tax return to report that if it's over a certain amount. Whereas in the Coverdale and the 529, any income that is made or that is earned on those accounts, they're tax deferred. So you don't have to do anything on that until you start withdrawing the, uh, the funds from those accounts to pay the tuition. Okay, so when it comes to planning for college and using these accounts, it depends on the parent's income and the projected income of the child. So on an UGMA and an UTMA, basically those accounts are owned by the student. So when he does the FAFSA or she does the FAFSA and they're calculating the financial aid, a larger amount of those accounts, of the money that's in those accounts will be counted as assets that are available to cover the tuition, which means that the student would have to sell or, or, or liquidate a lot of the UGMAs and the UPMAs in order to be able to cover the tuition before he goes into loans. Whereas the Coverdales and the 529s, those are, uh, the beneficiary does not own those. The student does not own those. The account, uh, the person who set up the account is the one that owns them. So when those get calculated into the financial aid formula, a smaller portion of those will be calculated against the child's income. So it, it's very likely that a student who has some type of a Coverdale or a 529 in his portfolio will be paying uh, less for tuition and will probably be getting more financial aid because less of this money will be counted uh, as available funds. Whereas an UGMA and an UGMA uh, the majority of those funds will be calculated as being available to pay the tuition. So that's something important to calculate because it also depends on the tax bracket of the parent and how much money the parent has disposable income to be able to cover the tuition without having to go into student loans. Now we're moving on to the resources for scholarships. Um, there's two slides. So on, on this one, scholarships are a form of financial aid which students apply to be used uh, for college expenses, which includes tuition, textbooks, supplies. Some schools include uh, housing as part of the total needs package, and then they calculate uh, scholarships based on that total amount. Some only use tuition, textbooks, and supplies, and lab fees, and things like that in calculating how much the student should be getting in scholarships. Um, scholarships are a form of financial aid. 
that is tax-free. The student does not have to pay any income tax on it because it's not considered income. And it's basically free funds, which means that the student does not have to pay it back. That's either based on financial need, financial need or uh, merit based on, on grades, based on other qualifications that a lot of the scholarships have as, uh, as requirements. Uh, and that's the next bullet. Many scholarships have specific requirements for applying based on income requirements, grade requirements, uh, major related requirements, which would be, um, you know, if you have a parent who went to a particular school and you're applying to that school, will the school give you a, um, a scholarship for you to attend uh, because you're a legacy student? Um, also based on your gender, your, your race, uh, your particular program of study, you know, if you want to become, uh, if you want to go into the health field, there are scholarships that are, are geared toward helping students who want to go into the nursing or the medical field. So those are, are when you're doing your scholarship um, applications and, and you're looking for, for different um, sources, also go based on what the student's uh, projected uh, career is. And on the next one, this slide covers all of the resources, or most of the resources, I should say, uh, that students have available to them. These are websites that accumulate scholarship information. It's usually updated by the different organizations. Uh, and these are good repositories for students to go in and go through the different scholarships that are available and see if there's anything that they might fit into based on the career that they want to pursue based on um, where they live. There are some scholarships that are state specific. Um, there are some that are based on, you know, if, if you go to a state school, uh, you will get a scholarship as long as you remain within that state after graduating for a certain number of years. So there's different requirements, but if you go through Scholarship Owl, FastWeb, RaiseMe, all of these will have a, a a menu, an inventory of different scholarships. And they range from, it be a $100 scholarship all the way to several thousand dollars. Um, if you have a student who needs financial aid and is in this application process, they should apply and suggest they apply to as many scholarships as they can, because the $100 scholarship can help with uh, a textbook. You know, the $1,000 scholarships can help with several textbooks or, or lab fees, depending on what they're doing. Uh, and this greatly helps um, in the college process uh, application. Um, schools right now are very expensive. State schools uh, are maybe high teens, maybe 20,000 and up uh, per year. City schools through CUNY, um, they're, I believe they're about six to 8,000. And then private schools range from 20 all the way up to 60,000 a year, if not more. So once the student has gone and the parents have gone through the FAFSA, they've gone through scholarships, they've gone through all other packages that they can apply for. What's left over is that that's still due to the school then usually gets covered through loans, student loans. So, and the FAFSA will <clears throat> give you an amount of what the projected student loans would be. You can use that as a basis. Uh, and there are several, there's two different types of student loans for the undergrad. So the first four years of college, there's two different types. One is subsidized and one is the unsubsidized. So subsidized means that the interest that you're gonna be charged on the loan will will not accrue while you're in school or while the payments are deferred. So they issue you, let's say you apply for school, you're starting the fourth semester, September 1st, let's just say, uh, for argument's sake, you get a loan dispersed and it's subsidized. There's no interest that's gonna start accruing at all while you're in school. Uh, and if you graduate, you're not able to get uh, any work yet, that's deferred, there's no interest charged. If it's unsubsidized, the minute they issue, they disperse the loan. So September 1st, interest will begin to accrue. Uh, so by the time you graduate, you're going to have the loans that are due plus the interest from the date that they were issued all the way through 
uh, the point that you start making the payments. So like the last box is like, you know, which type is better and why uh, to subsidize is the better one, just because the interest does not accrue until a later point in time. If you're in college for four years and you wind up getting, let's say, loans of like fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, interest on that could be fairly high. And by the time you graduate the fourth year, you wind up owing five, maybe up to ten thousand dollars just on interest, and you haven't even made one payment yet. So, and and the only problem with student loans is that you really don't have a choice into which one you get. You start getting, if you need an excessive amount, if you need a lot of money to, to go to college and your financial aid doesn't pack, doesn't cover it, and you have to go for student loans, you will first get subsidized loans. And those are capped at a certain amount and that changes based on your income need. It's changed based on your income. Uh, and it's capped also based on the amount that you need. So if you need loans of, Ten thousand dollars. It's possible that you'll get a subsidized loan for six thousand, and the other four thousand has to go through an up subsidized loan. So you really don't have a choice. It's a package that gets given to you, but the sequence would be uh, scholarships first, uh, like I said, grants, any other free funds. Then you go into subsidized loans, and then after that would be unsubsidized loans, and that'll be the sequence of of the you know, of your financial aid package. Any questions up to this point? I can't see the chat, but if there's anything on the chat. There, there's nothing in the chat right now, but I kind of wanted to ask, I know mm -hmm. with like student loans, there's also a difference between like when it's in the student's name and then when it's in like the parent's name on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Okay. So usually the student loans first go under the student's name. Um, so you'll wind up getting an unsubsidized and a subsidized depending on the amount. If there is still an amount due and the family cannot make what they can, what the FAFSA calculation considers to be uh, the family contribution toward the educational package, then you have to go through a third set of loans. And that's usually the parent plus loans. And that's the one that the parent has to take out in order to cover uh, that shortfall that the parent might not be able to, to pay for. In that case, those loans are the parent's loans and they are usually unsubsidized and they're at a higher rate. So you can potentially, if you're going to a very expensive school uh, and your financial aid package is not, um, is not high, you might wind up with subsidized loans as a student, unsubsidized loans as a student, and the parents might wind up with an unsubsidized loan as a parent to cover that difference. And that's in addition to, so the parent has at that point their own obligation, they can start paying it, uh, at any point in time while the student is in school, they can also ask for a deferment if they want to wait until this child finishes school or if they're having some financial issues. So they can also do the deferment. So they, they get the same benefits as the student uh, as far as deferring it for a certain period of time. Um, and then those loans either run 10 years or 15 years, I believe. Thanks for the question. That was, that was a good question. Uh, excuse me, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a high school student, and uh, I want uh, to get people to give me uh, cash give cash gifts to help me pay for college. And uh, what type of bank account or other account should I set up for that? Okay, so you can have it in a regular savings or a money market account. Um, but like I said earlier, the problem would be that anything that's in your name will have to be used to a higher degree than your parents. So. If it's possible to open up a joint account, a joint savings account, or a joint money management account, which will pay you a little bit more interest with your parent, have one of the parents be the primary in the account and you become the secondary, which means that you still have access to the account. That amount will be used, less of the money that you have in that account will be used for your financial aid. So let's say that you have an account under your name and you have $1,000 in the account. Once the FAFSA and the school calculates how much you should be contributing, they'll say you have to contribute out of your pocket 800 bucks, which means that $800 out of your thousand, you will need to contribute toward the school. If it's under a parent's account, 
the calculation, I believe, is like 16 or 18 percent, which means that anywhere between $160 or $180 needs to be contributed from that account. Just because a parent's account is used less in calculating what you need to pay. So if, if, if you're comfortable having a joint account with one of the parents, have them as a primary and you become the secondary and you can put all that income in there and you'll have more money available uh, to use for school, but it's something that you can use on your own and not necessarily be band-aided that before you get a loan or before you get any other type of financial aid, you need to spend this amount. That way you, you wind up making the money last a little bit more. Uh, now, one thing also to be aware of is that FAFSA calculates a number, and then the schools also calculate a number for your financial aid package. Uh, schools have a different criteria at times. They'll, they'll, they'll want students within a certain grade. If they're doing anything with sports, they'll want a, a student who has a particular background in a, in a particular sport. Uh, and the school might kick in more money. So they might give you a little bit more on scholarships from their own funds. Like schools have an endowment fund that they can also tap to give financial aid to students. Um, and believe it or not, it's negotiable. You can negotiate with schools as to how much you want and how much you think that you should get. Um, and let me explain how that goes. Let's say you have, you've been accepted to multiple schools. Let's say three schools. Uh, and their tuition is basically the same. And the, there's one particular one that you want to go to more than the other two. But that one didn't give you as, as big of a financial package uh, as you would like. And one of the other two that you didn't want to go to gave you a much better package. So when you look at the bottom line, you would, it would cost you less to go to one of these other schools, but you really didn't want that school. And the one that you really wanted didn't give you that much money. You can actually go to the school that you want to attend and you can have a discussion with the financial aid uh, folks and let them know that, you know, why you think that school is better than the other ones, why you think that you will be a better student in that school. And you would tell them you gave me this particular financial aid package, but this other school that also accepted me gave me this amount. Uh, why is there a difference and can you match what they're giving me? And believe it or not, if they really want to keep you as a student, they'll match the financial aid package from the other school. Uh, that happened to my daughter. Those two schools that she applied to, one gave her a better package than the other. She went to the other school and said, this other school gave me a much better package. What can you do for me? And they increased their financial aid package and matched it. And I think did a little bit better than just matching it. And, uh, and she wound up going to the school that she wanted with the amount of money that she would have gotten from the other school. So a lot of schools, you know, at, at first they give you a number but if they see that you're serious about going to that school uh, and that you've gotten a financial aid package from another school that's um, much better uh, and you have a discussion with them, they'll match it. So that, that, that's something to always keep in mind. The number that they give you and they say, we can only give you, uh, I don't know, $10,000, let's say, as this particular scholarship. That might be the case because of the particular scholarship that they, they're using to fund your package, but they have a separate pot of money through their endowment fund that they can use to give you more money if they really want to retain you as a student. So always always remember that if um, when you're doing your, your college hunting and your, um, your financial aid uh, package. Do you have any recommendations on how to like like start that negotiation with like financial like what what like how how would you start that interaction sure so once you've applied to the various schools and you've gotten admissions letters you usually wind up getting a financial aid letter and a financial aid letter will give you the full package stating these are the scholarships you'll be getting these are the grants you'll be getting uh this is what we expect the family contribution to be and then these amounts will be through unsubsidized and subsidized loans uh, and there, there's usually um, a calculation in between that, that you'll see how much is basically what I call free money and then how much is the loans. And you do the comparison of all those numbers across the colleges that have or the universities that have accepted you uh, and that you have already received 
a financial aid package from in a letter. And at that point, you kind of go back and you say, okay, so what do I like about this school? Why did I apply to this school in the first place? And you kind of narrow it down and you're like, at that point, decide which one do I really want to go to? Now, some students will make that decision based on the dollar amount, like how, which one can I really afford? And that's the one they'll go to. But if there's one that you really want to go to because of the programs that they have, the reputation that they have, uh, either the you know, legacy because your parents went there at some point, uh, and there's one that you think that you'll be a better student for or that you'll get a better education at, and that one doesn't really fit your financial aid package, that's when you start contacting those schools, that school, and letting them know that you received a financial aid package from the other schools. It's a little bit different. Uh, but they had a little bit, you know, they had much more money. Uh, can you match that? Because I really want to go to your school. And then at that point, you express the, 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 you know, why you want to go to our school, why it's important, important for you to attend that school, and how you think you'll be a better student, and how you think you'll be uh, an asset to that college or that university's community as a student. They like all that. They like to hear that students are really eager to go. Uh, to that to, to the schools you know if you highlight a particular program and you think that their program is one of the better ones in that area as opposed to the other schools that's something that you also use as a selling point because they like to hear that um students and parents think that their education is is much better it's a better degree than the others and at that point they start recalculating their numbers they start looking at what their endowment fund has uh, and they'll start looking for other grants or scholarships within each of the departments you know you might apply to a health allied department nursing or or, or pre-med and there might be what they call a chair person grant of some type where somebody has endowed you know the chairperson with money that they can give it to specific students to go into that department and and, and take that type of uh, degree so that's something that once you have the admissions letter the financial aid package letter then you figure out which ones you really want to go to. And that's the one that you start addressing uh, and kind of negotiating and saying, you know, I really want to go to school. What can you do for me? This is what the other schools are doing for me. Um, because bottom line is that all of the schools use the same FAFSA formula to calculate how much the family's contribution should be and how much the loans will be depending on the uh, on the tuition, but if the tuitions are basically in the same range, the package should be, should be similar. But if you get one that gives you a much, much better package, that's the one that you use to kind of uh, get you into the other school that you really want. If you get the good package from the one that you really wanted, then then you're golden, then, then you're good. You don't have to do anything. But um, But if it's not, then always open up that negotiation, always have that conversation with your financial aid folks. Okay, so, so now we're moving into the other financial basics, which um, we've covered in, in most of our calls, but it's something that's important to always bring back because it, it's, it's always something that you need to keep in the back of your mind. Um, now that we're going toward the end, of, you know, close to the end of the year, what are your goals? You know, did you accomplish your goals for this year? Which goals you still have that you want to complete? Um, and how do you budget for those goals? So the, the basic layout should, it's usually that 50% of your income usually covers your living expenses. Uh, and that helps you live, hopefully you live within your means and you cover your, your living expenses with 50% of your income. That has continued to go higher because salaries have not uh, gone up with the same rate of inflation. And certain things have gone up <clears throat> um, at a higher rate than other things. So 50% is, is an average. You should also be uh, paying yourself first, 10%. So 10% of your income may believe that you are an expense, just like you pay rent, mortgage, anything else. You add yourself as an expense item and you pay yourself 10%, put it into a money market account, um, which will pay you a little bit more interest than the normal accounts and it's still accessible. And that will also cover your short-term goals. Uh, you should donate 10%, you know, or, you know, or shouldn't say should, but you, you can donate you know, 10% uh, helping charities of different kinds. 
the charities that you feel uh, that touch you or that you feel a need for. Then you have your long-term goals, which include uh, retirements and your other investments. That should be about 30%. Uh, you should start saving for retirement as soon as you can, as soon as you start working, put money aside. Uh, if you've been in the workforce for a while and there's a 401k in, in your job, make sure that you're putting as much as you can. If the employer matches it, make sure that you put as much as you can so you get the match because every percentage point or every dollar that the employer matches on a 401k is basically 100% return uh, on your investment from day one. And then it continues to increase based on the investments uh, tax deferred. Then you should have an emergency fund, which is usually three to six months of expenses. So when you go through your budget and, and you need, let's say $5,000 a month to, to survive, uh, you should have between three and six months in order to be able to to have the coverage that you need just in case you lose your job or you get ill and you can't work or you can't get the amount of income that you were getting for that time period. That became very important during COVID. A lot of people were, um, some people lost their jobs or some people became, uh, you know, got very sick uh, and their income flow wasn't the same as it was prior to, to COVID. Um, so that, that's, that's always something that you should have available. For, for a rainy day, those are the rainy day funds. We do have a quick question in the chat based mm -hmm. on the model. So would you, do you have any budget cuts or modification, modifications that you might suggest when people don't have an emergency fund that would be for about three to six months? Yes, yeah, there, there's usually in, in the budgets that we see, um, we see, uh, you know, take out, we see uh, Dunkin' Donuts, we see uh, the Starbucks. Um, you know, don't you, I, we're not saying to deprive yourself of those things, but cutting down on, on those things helps. So cutting down from three lattes a week, maybe two, that little bit helps to free up some funds that you can put into an emergency fund. Also, when it comes to household expenses, uh, as far as utilities, uh, the electric and the gas, if you use an ESCO, which is uh, an independent company that sells energy through your local company like Con Ed. Instead of buying the energy from Con Ed, you would buy it through an ESCO. It's usually a couple of cents less per kilowatt than Con Ed is. So changing over to an ESCO, uh, and you can do that you know, several times a year. Just look at the ones that have the better rates and you can switch over. That also saves you. Uh, saves you money. Uh, also, comparing cable TV to streaming services. Uh, cable TV now, even with the with the triple play, where you have the phone and you have the internet and you have cable vision, they give you a better price. And sometimes they'll have a promotion for a year or for two years. They'll give you a certain price, but then it skyrockets once that promotional period ends. So look at, you know, do you really need to have a home phone if you're using your cell phone? A lot of people have cut their landlines and use cell for everything. Um, look at the packages that, you know, Cablevision or, or some of the other cable companies have. The silver package, the gold package, like 300 channels, do you use all 300 channels? Uh, you can cut down to like a basic package and then, which is the lower priced one, and then do streaming through Amazon, you know, the Prime or Hulu or Netflix. And you still have a pretty good inventory of, of, of shows that you can see. And bottom line, the cost is much less. Um, so those are the, the, like right over the top of my head, things that we have seen that are, are very quick in, in lowering your current expenses and freeing up a couple of dollars here and there that you can put in your emergency fund. Uh, in your emergency fund, you don't have to build it up you know, you know, very quickly. You can do it little by little. You can build it up uh, week by week. Um, you know, Look at what you spend in a particular week and see what you could have done different. And then for next week, you can make a change in, in money that you save, put it into the emergency fund. Um, Would you also maybe like 
how would it work, say, if I, for example, I wanted to invest a little less and then be able to build up my emergency fund? Like, how would, like, because you have them split out in percentages, like donations, 10%, like investment, 30%. Like, would those, could some of those percentages you're putting towards money change in the short term while you're trying to build up an emergency fund? Yes, yes, you can do that as well. Yes, you can do the the investment piece of like the 30%, you can lower it a little bit in order to increase your emergency fund, uh, but then come back to it and increase it back to 30. Make sure that for retirement, you always have uh, as much as you can put away. Uh, paying yourself first, I would also always keep that at the 10%. Uh, and you can make that pay yourself first part of your emergency fund as well. If you classify yourself as an expense, like I said earlier, uh, some of that money you can set it aside as an emergency fund. Uh, so the paying yourself first will be for short-term goals, but you can use part of that and also build it up. So yes, yeah, so you can move around these categories to build your emergency fund, but then always come back to, to them and make sure that your uh, investment in retirement is at the 30 range, 25 to 30 range, and that your pay yourself first is always at at least 10 once you have your emergency fund. Okay, so... <laughs> Now that we're toward the end of the year, there's certain things that you should always be looking at so that you don't get hit when you're finalizing your tax uh, return with your accountant with any unexpected tax bills. So look at your W-2. Um, first of all, look at what you did last year. Last year, did you wind up paying taxes when you file your tax return or did you get a refund? Uh, based on that, there should have been an adjustment made to your withholdings. So look at your pay stubs now and see how much you've paid in taxes so far. Um, look at how much you should pay. You can actually, with your accountant, calculate an estimated uh, tax amount of how much you think you're going to owe at the end of the year. Look at your um, look at your pay stubs and see how much you've paid so far, just to make sure that you have enough taxes paid. Uh, if you're self-employed that's that's it, it's it's even more important to do this because there are no withholdings from any of the payments that you receive if you're self-employed so it's your responsibility to make sure that you're making estimated payments on a quarterly basis to cover your tax liability at the end of the year uh, so go through that also with your accountant you can go through with them and say listen I've, I've made x amount so far this year in income and my projected expenses or this amount. So I think I'm going to wind up with a net income subject to tax of about this. And, and he'll calculate it for you uh, or with you and, uh, and then let you know if you have to make an estimated tax payment for the end of the year. If you've made estimated tax payments, make sure that they're very close to what you should be making. Otherwise, this last payment of this year should probably bump it up a little bit to come as close as you can to the liability. You, you don't want to owe a lot of tax, but you also don't want to get a large refund at the end. Because if you've gotten a large refund at the end of the year, it means that you overpay your taxes during the year. And that's money that you could have had uh, in your pocket that you could have put into an emergency fund. So let's say you get a refund of $2,000. Um, that could have been, that equates to about $20 a week or so. So imagine having that extra $20 a week, you could have put it into your emergency fund. So you don't want to get a large refund either. Uh, look at a Roth IRA. Any available cash that you have sitting in, let's say, uh, just a savings that you don't really need, and you've, if you've already established your emergency fund, that extra money, you can put it into a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA will accumulate basically tax deferred and tax free. And when you start withdrawing that money after your retirement age, whatever you take out is totally tax free. So that's something uh, to always consider. And you can open up a Roth IRA at, at any age. Um, again, make sure your emergency fund is funded for you know those three to six years. And then look at your goals for 2025. What do you want to do next year? Um, did you achieve your goals for this year? Uh, do you want to carry them over because you didn't get to do that vacation or that cruise? Or do you want to do something different? So what are your plans for 2025? And then that starts the planning cycle for how you fund it. You know, how do I save enough money so that I can 
retire early or so I can go on that you know, month long cruise that I wanted to go to. Um, so now is the time to start thinking of that as well. Um, one thing to remember is that every decision that you make has a financial impact and has a tax impact. So every time you're going to, you're thinking of doing something, um, planning a vacation, buying a car, buying a house, it all has a financial impact uh, at multiple levels and it has, uh, they all have a tax impact as well. Great segue to the next slide, like what to do now. These are all reminders. These are all things to kind of jog your memory uh, at this point of the year. And these are things that you should always be on the lookout because things change uh, during the year. Um, if you have investment accounts, if you have retirement accounts, if you have uh, any kind of savings, even a basic savings account or checking account, uh, check your beneficiary designation. See who you have as a beneficiary. God forbid something happens to you. Who can have access to that money? Who can have access to the accounts uh, and use that? Um, either to to help you if you're sick or to take care of expenses if, if something happens. Check your beneficiary designations, keep them up to date. Have, uh, like we have a fireproof uh, secure bag, um, but you can have it basically anywhere, but have it handy where you have your birth certificates, your social security cards, your marriage certificates, divorce certificates, uh, special instructions with uh, funeral arrangements or contracts that you have with funeral homes or a cemetery if you're already prepaid, your last rites, uh, passports, uh, anything that's important that usually gets asked for if you're doing uh, an official transaction or a government uh, application of any kind, make sure that you have that in a secure location. Um, also have a list of all those files so that you know, yes, I do have, I have like a little checklist. I do have all of the certificates here. I do have the passport. I have all of these documents. Uh, so you make sure that you have what you need. Uh, also keep a list of your passwords. There are password um, files, password books. There's actually an online password portal, which is, um, which we would, I think is on a monthly subscription and you can set up all your passwords and keep it there as a repository so that when you need to um, get a password you don't remember you log in and it gives you the the login name and the actual password and if you do that all you really have to remember is that one password to get into that one portal and then that will have everything listed um, and then give that information or put that information where your important documents so that if somebody needs to access your accounts, if something happens to you, they have access to that. If you have any trust accounts, any trust documents, or you have property to the extent that you might wind up with, a, with an estate, have all those documentations as well. Power of attorneys, um, have power of attorneys in place. Uh, if something was to happen to you, incapacitated, or you pass, so that somebody can handle your uh, your last wishes. Power of attorney is only valid while you're alive. So a power of attorney, for whatever reason, you get sick and you cannot do something because you're physically not able to, the person who has the power of attorney can do that for you. If you pass, the power of attorney automatically ceases and nobody can actually do anything with the power of attorney. But you need to have um, you should have advanced directives uh, for your health care. Uh, you know, what do you want to, to be done if you're incapacitated and you can't make a decision? Have somebody, you can either lay out what you want to be done or have somebody uh, with those specific instructions and the authority to do that. And that goes with the will, living will as well, living trust, and any HIPAA authorizations that you need. So that somebody, if you're in the hospital, somebody can actually speak to the doctors, what's going on, what's the treatment plan, you know, what's the outlook. Um, without any of those documentation, basically nobody can, can discuss anything with the doctors. And if there's a decision that needs to be made and you're incapacitated and you cannot make it, and there's no documentation in place uh, designating anybody else, um, the hospital will, will make the decision of what they think is best for you, or they'll have to get a court order to do it. So keeping the paperwork in place, keeping everything up to date, uh, and to 
satisfy your your wishes it's what's most important and these are also these change with time so we'll try to keep these up to date you know contemporaneously um if, if you have a child or you adopt a child that will change a uh, different thing that will change the directives that you might have it might change the beneficiaries that you have it might establish some type of a trust for the child so one one particular life occurrence can can impact a lot of different things so be cognizant of that always consult with uh, an attorney uh, and always consult with uh, with an accountant to figure out what's the best route to take uh, based on your current situation and projected plans if you plan to do something also uh, let your accountant know before you do it if you plan to buy a house let the accountant know that you're planning to buy a house go through the tax implications, go through the financial implications. Um, I was speaking to uh, a co-worker of mine who had a client, tax client, who he was always telling him that he wanted to buy a house. And the accountant, my friend, told him, yes, you should buy a house, you know, and these are the types of um, tax benefits that you will get as far as deducting interest for the mortgage and deducting the, the, the real estate taxes. So the person, you know, was at this point was well, so it is an advantage. I should be doing it. The person went out and actually borrowed money from actually didn't borrow money. They actually pulled out from their IRA 150000 in order to put the down payment for a house. So next year rolls around. He goes back to my friend, the accountant, his accountant. He tells him, oh, I finally bought the house and talking about the house. He's very happy when he gives the accountant the 1099 for the distribution from the IRA shows that there was $150,000 distribution. And they only took, I believe, 5% taxes. So between the person's income and $150,000 that was now taxable income and only 5% of taxes, he was actually up to the 28, 30% tax bracket. He wound up owing the IRS about $50,000, which Right now, he's negotiating with the IRS and trying to get into a payment plan. So if you plan to make any major purchases or any purchase, even if it's like a car or something small, or you plan to go into a particular investment of some type, let your accountant know so that they can really calculate the full impact. That way, you don't get surprised at the end uh, to find out that the decision that you made or the investment that you made is going to cost you uh, an extraordinary amount of, of taxes or or whatever other problems come up with it okay. that would thank you very much that was like very detailed if we had questions on this like do you have like an email like contact information to like follow up on some of this yes so the next slide has resources which we can send it out in in an email to everybody so you can actually go back through uh, some of the things that i discussed and look at it in more detail and then the last slide, that's my contact information. I have my email, phone number, and office address. Don't hesitate to reach out. You can send me an email. Uh, you can call me. We can set up a call. And we can go through any uh, questions that you have based on the presentation that I made or any questions that you have in general. I'll be more than happy to, to discuss. Mm -hmm.